you're thankful your sins are gone, why don't you lift your hands? Hallelujah. And worship Him. My sins are washed. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, what a message. What a Savior. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Praise the Lord. If you turn your Bibles tonight to the first epistle to the Thessalonians chapter 4, I'll let you remain seated. I'm just going to read one phrase this evening. Since the beginning of the year, we've been with our theme, Back to the Basics. We've talked about back to the basic disciplines, prayer, Bible reading, fasting. Last week, we had one out of order. We was talking about, I never even introduced it as such, but back to the basic deeds. And one of those is water baptism. But tonight, we're going to be back to the back to the doctrines, the basic doctrines. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about the doctrine of justification. Tonight, we're going to speak and preach about the doctrine of sanctification. The doctrine of sanctification. I'm not going to be going in depth with this tonight, but I'm going to try to capsulize what we believe when we talk about sanctification. And I want to say right from the first, I may say it again just a few moments, but sanctification is more than a doctrine. It's an experience and an encounter with God. In the end, only God can sanctify our hearts and our lives. And He will if we'll invite Him to do so. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 3, you know, we get carried away with the will of God. Is it God's will for me to marry this one or marry that one? Is it God's will for me to buy this, buy that? And I, I'm, I'm, I'm in no way minimizing that. James said, you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this. But there are some things in Scripture that He's made clear to us what His will is. And this is one of the instances where God makes clear to us what His will is. I'm just going to read the first part of the verse. He said, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. Let me tell you, believer, what God's will for your life is. It's that you experience sanctification. Did I read that correctly? This is the will of God, even your sanctification. Praise the Lord. I don't know if you know the extent of the ministry of those guys back there in the tech room. They've got quite the ministry. Now, a while back, I had preached on sanctification, and Sister Darla wasn't with us yet. And Brother Keith got the CD. I'm telling what his story with his permission. He sent her this CD on sanctification. And God used that to bring them together. A message on sanctification. After Brother Keith telling that, it looks like those that are looking for mates would be begging me to preach on sanctification and would be swamping the tech room buying copies of that what a ministry I mean sleep aid matchmaking keep it up guys but I want to preach on sanctification tonight now, I want you to hear the whole of what I say because so often in our circles when we hear the word sanctification, our minds immediately go to externals, things we call standards. It's the first place our mind goes. I'm afraid, I believe in those things, convictions and all of that, but I'm afraid we get the cart before the horse. We want to start talking about the externals without talking about the experience that brings those things into our lives. Amen? You see, these externals are in fact the results of sanctification. They are not 
sanctification. Let me give you an illustration. Sometimes people in a Pentecostal service will point to the shouting and they'll point to even the speaking in tongues and they'll say, now that's the Holy Spirit. No, that's not the moving of the Holy Spirit. That's the evidence. That's the results of the moving of the Holy Spirit. If it's a move of the Holy Spirit, it's going a lot deeper than what you hear and what you see. And all these externals may be the result of sanctification, but they are not sanctification. I'm going to be oversimplifying tonight, but when I think of sanctification, I would say this. Sanctification is a divine change of the heart. It's a divine change of a person's desire. It's a divine giving of direction. It's a changing of the way someone thinks. It's the changing of the way someone feels. It's the changing of the will to conform to the will of God. And all of this that I'm talking about, this changing of the inner life, it's brought about by the work of of the word of God it's brought about by the word of God and the spirit of God Jesus prayed over his disciples and through them he prayed for us and he said father sanctify them through thy word through thy truth thy word is truth he meant I believe God has an experience for the believer even if they'll open up their heart to the word of God and the spirit of the Lord there will be an inner change in the inner life. Amen. John Wesley called this a moment in God. He said when you get saved, that's a moment in God. But he said after you've got saved, there are other moments in God. Hallelujah. I'm glad as wonderful as salvation is, I'm glad God has more for us after salvation. Glory to God. And that's the work of sanctification. In Bible terms, sanctification literally means to set apart it means to set apart that's what it means to set apart from and to set apart to and to set apart for you read it in the scripture hear me tonight young people you read it in the scripture amen something became sanctified it became holy when it was taken from the world and separated from the world but it just wasn't a movement from the world that made it sanctified it was a separation to God to the work of God to the things of God to the people of God amen so sanctified Sanctification was a separation from, but it was a separation to, and it was a separation for. Why was something separated from the world and separated to God? It was separated for a purpose. It was separated to be used for God, to be a vessel, an instrument for God's purposes and God's plan. Amen. The Bible word is sanctification. That's the word we're used to. But in the church world today, they're calling it something else. I'm glad whatever they call it, they've, they've turned back to it. Uh, our church world for a, a period of time has preached what I'm going to show you in a minute. Uh, but they preach that just being saved, uh, that salvation experience was all that there was. Uh, but they realize they made a mistake. Uh, and thank God by His Spirit, He's turning whole churches, whole groups around, saying that there's got to be more. But instead of calling it sanctification this time, they call it spiritual formation or transformation. I don't know how you feel about it, but it's not so much what you call it, it's whether or not we allow it to happen to our life. Call it sanctification, we need it. Call it spiritual formation, we need it. Call it transformation, we need it. I don't know how you feel, but I want to open up my life to the working of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Lord, change me. Change the way I think. Change the way I feel, change the way I do, change the way I will, just change me Lord into your likeness, into your image give me your divine nature purify my heart, cleanse my heart oh God hallelujah, make me more like you, sanctify me spirit, soul and body, hallelujah some people and in some churches and some traditions, you'll never hear about sanctification. But I want to tell you tonight that over 900 times in the Bible, the word, some form of the word sanctification is used. 
We may not notice that because it's been translated different ways. We have the word sanctify, sanctification, holy, holiness, purity sometimes, and saints. But they all have something in common. They all come from the same word. Let me give you an illustration in English. We take the word work. It's used as a verb. I work in the garden. It's used as a noun. I my work is difficult. It's used. It's used as an adjective. Where are my work book boots? And so it's the same word. And somehow the other sanctification they use different words for nouns and for verbs. And they use sanctify for a verb, and they use holiness for a noun. And and saints and all of this and holy. But in the in the Bible, it all came from the same word. Even it's this idea of separation. Glory to God. Amen. So I, what I'm trying to say is, how can the church ignore it? How can the church look over it? How can the church world say it's not something we need? When 900 times in the Bible. I mean, do you realize that just over a very handful of verses, we have the doctrine of Christ coming in the flesh, the incarnation, over just a few verses. Amen. We establish other of our doctrines, and yet 900 times in Scripture, there's a reference to sanctification. I think the scripture is replete enough with sanctification that God is trying to tell us something. And number one, it ought to be a doctrine. But more important than just being a doctrine, a teaching of the church, it ought to be something we experience in the altars, we experience in our prayer time. It ought to be the desire of every person, every person that claims to be a believer. Your prayer ought to be like Paul's was for the saints sanctify me starting on the inside spirit soul all the way out to the body I want to be separate I want to be separate from the world I want to be separated to God and I want to be separated for the purpose of being used by his hand talking about the basic doctrine of sanctification I believe this is true not only because it's in the Bible but I believe any truly born again believer has a desire to be a better person. I believe any sincere believer has a desire to have more of Christ. I believe I'm talking to you tonight. If you're here and you're a believer, you have a desire to please the Father more and more. You have a desire to live on a higher plane, to go deeper in God. You have a desire to overcome temptation. I believe if you're sincerely born again, you have a desire to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus. Amen. I think the church world has seen the mistake. They've taught all you got to do at some point in your life life uh, pray and say Lord forgive me come into my heart and then you go on and live your life any way you please uh, because he saved you by his blood uh, yes uh, that is true but I believe if a person really gets saved and born again uh, in born and bred within their hearts uh, it's a desire to be more like Jesus uh, conformed to his image uh, should it be thought strange uh, that someone would desire God to do a further work in his life beyond that initial encounter of salvation should it be strange that the people of God that have new life in them would not desire more and more of God let me tell you what happens if a person's really born again they have a desire for more of God but it's not just that the person has a desire for more of God God's got a desire for that person too God's desire is to restore us to the perfection that he created man God's desire is to conform us to the image of Christ. God's desire is to impart His nature to us. And you take a person having a desire for more of God, you take God having a desire to perfect them, and let those two desires come together, and you have sanctification. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. So it's a doctrine and an experience. Now, I want to talk about just some things and bring this down before we quit tonight. But we must not. I've alluded to this several times, but please hear me out. I don't preach on this all the time. So tonight, hear me out. We must not confuse sanctification with justification. 
we preach about justification. That's a wonderful thing that happens. That God takes someone with sin in his life and through the blood and work of Christ, God says, you are now righteous. Your sins are gone. Your sins are forgiven. You're now righteous before me. That is justification. Let me tell you what happens. People of our tradition, they believe in sanctification. And put in, in very simple terms, they believe when you really get saved, you'll live different than this world. You'll even look different from this world. You'll think different. Your entertainment will be different. The books you read will be different. The things you watch will be different. Everything about your lifestyle. Now, the, we, we're of that tradition. That's our roots. That's what we believe. But one or two things will happen. Number one, there'll be people who are not from that tradition. That'll be one set of people that'll say this. And the other set will be those who did believe what I just shared with you. But all of a sudden they've thrown that all away. And they begin to live any way they want to live. Do anything they want to do. And I can tell you what they're going to say before they say it when you bring up this thing about living differently from the world. You know what they're going to say? They're going to say, don't you know that works don't save us? You know what they've done? They'll say it every time. They'll say, don't you know you can do all of those things? And they're not going to say, you know what they're doing? They're confusing justification with sanctification. There's not anyone that truly believes in sanctification that believes that they're saved because they live a certain way. What they do believe is that they live a certain way because they've been saved. You must not confuse justification with sanctification. They'll say to you, I've heard them say it, look me in the eye. I quit doing all that stuff. I, I, I watch the same things the world watch now. I go to the same places because I finally realize I'm saved by grace and not by works. I look at them and say, you're totally confusing this. I believe that too. We are saved by grace and not by... We, there's no amount of works that could ever save us. It's our faith in the blood of Jesus. That's, but that's not sanctification. That's justification. Sanctification is, thank God I've been saved by the blood. I could not save myself. But now I want God to do a further work in me and help me to live like someone that's saved. It's not that I have to. It's not that I'm being forced to, but because I'm saved, I've got a desire. I just want to please the Lord. Yeah. Hallelujah. Let me just give you a little bit of contrast tonight. We'll move on. Instead of confusing them, let's contrast them. I'm not going to be able to give you all the scripture tonight for the sake of time, but just, just watch this with me. In justification, God declares we're holy. By the blood of Jesus, God says, you are holy. You've repented, you've believed. You are holy. That's justification. But sanctification is when God makes us holy. Amen? Amen? In justification, God takes away the penalty of our sin. You see, before you get saved... Before you get saved, you're living under the pending judgment of God. Your sins demand that God in His holiness judge you and I and send us to hell. But when God justifies us by our faith in the blood of Jesus, God takes away the pending judgment. And He says, because of the blood of my Son, the penalty of your sins your past sins that penalty that you should have to pay i've removed that it's kind of like having a huge mortgage and they're going to take away your home and someone comes along and pays your mortgage and lets you keep your home they've taken away the penalty of the missed mortgage payments. And that's what God does in justification. It's not anything that we've done or we've done what good. God has acted by the blood of Jesus and he's taken away the penalty of sin. But sanctification is, God's already taken away the penalty of sin, but sanctification is when God helps us to overcome the power of sin. I want you to know you can be forgiven of doing a certain sin, but that doesn't mean you're not going to be tempted to do that again. 
That doesn't mean that that thing's not going to rise up in your life. That's the reason we have people come and pray. I have no doubt they prayed. I have no doubt God forgave them. I have no doubt they got justified. But they didn't let God do the work of sanctification. And the thing that led them into sin the first time has risen up again. And it's led them back into sin. Instead of letting that thing lead them back into sin, they ought to come to God and say, God, sanctify me. Give me power over this thing. Give me power over this desire. Help me to overcome. I'm telling you, through sanctification, God gives us the power to live in victory over sin. In justification, God gives us forgiveness for the sins we have committed. But thank God in sanctification, God gives us the freedom from the desires for the sins we would commit. Do you believe that? Do you believe God can give you freedom from the desires for sin? You know, this is a thing the church world's missed too long. It's not just that God's wiped my slate clean, but God can do a work in my heart and break that power and desire of sin in my life and give me victory. In justification, God deals with the fruit of our sin. In sanctification, God deals with the very root of our sin. I've saved it for now. But the, the whole doctrine and experience of sanctification is based on this fact. Even though we are saved, we still have that old sinful nature that we all were born with. If you please, it goes clear as deep as our, the, 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 our genetics. Anyone that tells you they're born without that nature has just proved that they have been born with it. They're lying to you. In justification, God wipes away all the sins of that sinful nature. But in sanctification, God begins to get into the root and deal with that nature that brought us into sin. Hallelujah. In justification, God takes care of past sins. But in sanctification, God takes care of that which would lead us back into sin. I'm glad He does it. Let me give you quick, two quick illustrations. We'll move on. First of all, there are some folks that are horribly in debt. And not just because of hard times or reverses. They're horribly in debt because of their lifestyle. Brother Brock, Andrew, you help me out. Stand up, Andrew. Let's say Andrew's one of those. He's, he's 30 years old. He's got 24 credit cards. I'm telling you, he's horribly in debt. Now, I'm going to tell you what could happen. I could come along as a millionaire, feel compassion because he's so far in debt, and say, I'll tell you what I'm going to do for you. You don't deserve this. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to pay off every credit card, every mortgage. I'm going to wipe out your debt. That's enough to shout over, isn't it? But not only am I going to wipe out your debt, I'm going to put money in the bank for you. Now that's what God does in justification. He wipes out our debt of sin, but He also gives us money in the bank. He gives us the righteousness of His Son. But I want to tell you what's going to happen to 99% of the people that's in His shape. If I paid off His debts... And put money in the bank. It wouldn't be six months. And he'd be in the same shape. You know what he needs? To stay out of debt. And keep the money in the bank. He needs a change of lifestyle. See justification. God pays our debts. Puts the money in the bank. The righteous. But sanctification. Is when he comes. And he changes our lifestyle. So we don't end up. In the same situation. That we was in. Thank you. Illustration number two. You have a toddler that has discovered the wonderful world of magic marker. I've got a picture of my grandson. He's not two yet, but it's all over him. You walk in, it's been quiet for a while, and if it gets quiet and you've got toddlers, something wrong, something going on. And you go down the hallway, and there's magic marker all over their face, all over their clothes, all over the walls. Now, I'm going to tell you what you can do. You can clean the walls, repaint them. 
You can clean their face with turpentine. I better not do that. I didn't mean that. Take that off the tape. They'll be calling somebody. <laughs> Whatever it takes, you can clean their face. You can wash it out of their clothes if you can get it out. Even give them new clothes. But until you take the magic marker away and instill some consequences where they don't want to do it again, there's going to be magic marker back on the walls and back on the face. I want to tell justification is when God cleans our face. God cleans the walls of our heart. Gives us new garments. Of, but sanctification is when through another divine work of His Spirit, He takes the magic marker away out of our hearts. Takes a desire. Oh, I'm glad for the work of sanctification. Now, some people, they stumble on sanctification because it's, it's almost in a paradox. There's always two sides and two dimensions. And just stay with me just a few minutes. I think this is so important. You see, when you look at sanctification in the Bible, you find it's both a position and a condition. The position is the moment you get saved, in one sense, the Bible says you're sanctified. You know what Paul called folks? I mean, Paul had a lot of faith in folks. You know what he called them? Saints. Now, we've so misused the word that we've lost the meaning of that. But saints literally means the holy ones, the sanctified ones. And then you read what he said in his epistle, and you found out they had a lot of problems, and yet he's calling them the holy ones, the saints. Why? Because when you get saved in position, you are sanctified, but in condition, you're not yet sanctified. I'll explain that in a moment. But when we get saved, we're set apart from the world in that God has changed our lives. We're born again. He declares us holy because of the righteousness of Christ. But we have not yet let God go to work and make us in practice what we are in name. When you get saved, you are a holy one, but your practice may not yet be holy. The, the, being called a holy one is justification. But when God makes us holy, that's sanctification. To be called holy is what you are in position. To be called sanctified at the moment of being saved is what we are in position. But when God makes us truly holy, that's what we will be in condition. He conditions us into His holiness. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. Now Micah, he had, he had studied a little bit and trained a little bit. But basically, when he enlisted in the army, the moment he signed those lines and was processed there in Cincinnati, in name, in position, he was a soldier. He didn't know all the marches. He didn't know the maneuvers. He, he didn't have the train. But in position, he was a soldier. And then they sent him out there to Georgia in the hot summer sun and they begin to make him in practice what he was in name. They put him through the training, put him through the drills, put him through the instruct. They were conditioning him to become in his very practice and life what he was. Now, he was no more a soldier when he came through boot camp in name than he was when he first signed up. But he was much more a soldier in lifestyle and in practice. I'm telling you, when we get safe in position, we're already holy in the eyes of God. People have said that. Don't you know you can't get any more holy than the blood of Jesus? You're exactly right. But you're talking about position now. Where I can become more holy is in my practice, in my living, in my desires. I had a friend that was raised a Catholic, got saved in the middle of a pot party. I mean, they were smoking pot. There was a big family Bible out on the coffee table. Happened to open it up. Revelation where it says, I'll make you kings and priests unto God. He read that and the Spirit of the Lord spoke to him. I'm talking about a Catholic boy. Spoke to him and said, if you will give me your life and accept Christ, I'll do that in your life. Right there, he gave his life and heart to the Lord. Didn't know where to go to church. Found a little Pentecostal church. Actually, it wasn't that small, but he went to Pentecostal. Pentecostal church God called him to preach he began preaching he's told me several times he said I was already preaching going out and preaching service after service and you'll understand this more if you know about Oklahoma he said but when I would leave to go preach I'd have that skull right skull uh, can right there in my pocket I said he said I dipped snuff going down the turnpike to my next place to preach now I told you he what, what he was raised in another religion he didn't know anything about this but he said it wasn't long 
Then I heard the Spirit speak to me and say, you shouldn't be doing that. I'm telling you, that day he got saved in that pot party, he couldn't have been any more holy, sanctified because of the blood of Jesus in position. But then God began to sanctify him and make him in condition what he was in position. And then there's also this about sanctification. You read in Scripture, sometimes it appears instantaneous and sometimes progressive. Amen. I'll tell you one thing sanctification never is, and that's eradication or the taking out of the sinful nature. I, where, I, where I was born and raised, there were some people around there, they taught that. They said when you get sanctified, God totally takes out the sinful nature. You'll never sin again. Some folks have confused justification with sanctification, but they confuse sanctification with glorification. It will not be till we drop this robe of flesh and rise and are made like into Christ's glorious body. And that's when we'll finally have that nature eradicated. So it's not eradication. Sometimes it appears instantaneous because there are moments of victory. How many has known of a thing you've wrestled with, struggled with, but in a moment's time, that which you had struggled with so difficultly with self-discipline and struggle with you, but in a moment of time, a time, the Spirit of the Lord came by, and from that point on, you had the victory over it. So it is instantaneous. But it's also progressive two ways. Number one, it's progressive because there's some things that it takes a period of time seeking God over and over again, getting into the Word, following the Word. It takes a period of time, and finally you realize you got victory over it. But that's not the only way it's progressive. Another way it's progressive is the fact that it seems like when we get one thing taken care of, we realize we've got another problem. <laughs> How many's kind of noticed that? God's not being mean. It's just the way it is. I mean, we've struggled with this thing, struggled, and God touches the Spirit. We get victory over it. Thank God I'm free. I'm free. I don't even want to do that thing. I detest it. I'm, you know, I'm just ready to, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm just pretty spiritual. <laughs> and then the next day, God opens up something else in your life. <laughs> you whip the snuff. But now you're yelling at your spouse. You're losing your temper. God says, let's go to work on that now. So it is progressive. I mean, aren't you glad God does it that way? Can you imagine taking a little kindergarten and saying, now we're going to learn our ABCs, but look, we're, let me show you. Start writing algebra problems on the board and say, you're going to have to learn this and then bring in some physics and show some physics slides. You're going to have to do this and, and, and then take you know, some calculus and put that up there and, and, and English literature and say, no, you're going to have to learn all of this before you get through school. Can you imagine those little kindergartners? Algebra, tricking off to calculus, physical science. They give it to them as they can handle it. And when they pass kindergarten, they go to first grade. And when they pass first grade, they don't have to face second grade work till they get to second grade. Well, God knows how we are. Aren't you glad He's merciful? He knows when to bring it to the forefront. But until we get home, I don't care if you serve Lord, the Lord 50 years, until you get home, God is going to be working on your life if you let Him. Sanctification. It's a process. You see, the changes, the changes that are revealed, the changes God makes in our life that are revealed by standards aren't really the most difficult things God needs to change. I'm not downplaying their importance. But there's things harder to get rid of than snuff. Amen. And there's things that's harder to get rid of than just cussing. I mean, there are things like anger and selfishness and bitterness and slothfulness. I'm not minimizing any of these other uh, th things of lifestyle or dress or entertainment. We'll get to those in just a moment. But I'm telling you, it's a lot harder. If, if you've got that old spirit of gossip, that's a lot harder to get over with than just not going to the movies. But God, He does that deep work. You see, there's, this, there's another thing here about sanctification. There's both man's part and God's part. Sometimes in Scripture it says, the, the, the writer says, sanctify yourselves. 
And other times it says, God will sanctify you, or the Spirit will sanctify you, or the Word. So what is it? Does God do it, or do we do it? Well, here's the thing. We sanctify what we can sanctify, and God sanctifies what we can't. I never forget Brother Clendenin telling the story. He said, "Is up front after the service, a man came up and said, Brother Clendenin, I want you to pray with me that, that God will help me give up smoking. Brother Clendenin said, Okay, bow your head, repeat after me. Dear God, dear God, I want to quit smoking. I want to quit smoking. And God, and God, if I ever smoke another one, if I ever smoke another one, kill me, God. Kill. I can't pray that. Well, maybe you can't take away the desire, but you can throw the pack away. And I'm using that for an illustration. Whatever it is, there's man's part and there's God's part. We had a new convert once. He was so excited about getting saved. He was, went over to a friend's house before Wednesday night service to invite him to church. He said, we got over there and I started explaining to him the Bible. Now, he calls me right before church. And he said, I started explaining him, to him the Bible. And all of a sudden, he said, do you want a drink? I said, sure. He said, I just kept explaining the Bible. He brought, you know, he brought out uh, the wine and poured a glass of wine. He said, I was sitting there drinking, uh, explaining the Bible what God had done and I was so excited and all of a sudden it hit me I, I might not ought to be drinking wine now that I'm saved he said preacher do I have that right and I said you sure do because God's got a different wine for you he's got the Holy Spirit for you he meant see it will catch up but you know if, if you have that problem you can do one or two things you may go and pour it out because you want to break its bondage on you or you may come and God has broke the bondage but you go home and you pour it down the drain because you don't want to be tempted by it again but there are some things we can do there are some things we can stay away from there are some things that we can practice but what we can't do that's when he does the inner work can you say amen we separate ourselves from what we can and God will separate from us what we can't and then there's this thing that sanctification is inside and out. The Bible says, cleanse yourself from the filthiness of the flesh. Paul said, I pray that you be sanctified spirit, soul, and body. Inside and out. Now again, I think, I think the problem is, is sometimes the emphasis has been upon getting the outside taken care of. But there's never been a change on the inside. It'll never work that way. No amount of change to the outside will ever change the inside of a person. But when the inside of a person's been changed, it will inevitably show on the outside. You believe that tonight? I believe that. I want to tell you this. I don't want to disappoint you. If you're a young lady and you, you want to get married someday, I don't want to disappoint you. But putting a wedding dress on will not make you a bride. But if you're going to be a bride, you will be putting on a wedding dress. <laughs> And there's a lot of things that we believe and we practice. And just doing those things and conforming to those things, it will not change you. But if you're changed, it's going to show up in your life. Can you say amen? You see, if your heart is holy, you won't want, if you're a young lady or not so young, whatever... But if your heart is holy, if you desire the image of Christ, you desire to be clean and pure, you won't want to wear something that's immodest, that displays your, your flesh, that is a problem in creating unholy desires in others. Amen. If you have a holy heart, you won't want to have anything in your lifestyle that's identified with the world, that expresses the values or lack of, of the world. If you have a heart that wants to be holy, you don't want to watch something that makes you feel dirty and unclean and brings out in you unholy desires. Why? Because you have a desire to be holy. You don't want that. You won't want to listen to music that stirs up desires for the world rather than creates desires for God. I'm telling you what's going on in the inside will determine the outside. If you have in your heart a desire to be conformed to the image of Christ, you'll also have a desire to maintain the image which God created you. And He created them male and female. And if you have a desire to be in the image of Christ, if 
you're a male, you'll have a desire to dress, act, talk like a male. And if you have a desire as a young lady for the image of Christ, you'll have a desire to be the kind of female that God created a female to be. Amen. There'll be that distinction there. Why? It comes from the heart. It comes from the heart. I had a friend one time, he said, it doesn't do any good to preach the externals to carnal folks. And that's really true. But you have somebody that's got a heart for God. Amen. They're, they're, they want to please God in everything they do. It's not a matter of argument. It's not a matter of, of getting into different opinion. It's just that I want to please the Lord. And the thing that you see on the outside is a result that God is working on me. And it'll be a humility of heart. It won't be I'm more righteous than anyone. It'll be, oh, I'm so thankful God's at work in my life. I'll close with this thought. I'm trying to speak theological things without being too involved tonight. But when I think of sanctification in the New Testament, I immediately take note that usually it's in the context of of Jesus coming his return that he might present it unto himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or blemish he said be blameless until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ he that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure so sanctification is in the context of Christ coming and I, literally, I really believe this. A person seeking sanctification is a person whose heart is set on being ready for Jesus' return. And I believe the converse is true. You show me someone that has set their heart on being ready for Jesus' return. And I'll show you someone that's saying, Oh God, cleanse me. Cleanse my motives, my actions, my everything about me. He that hath this hope purifieth himself oh hallelujah I begin to think what people do to their bodies trying to measure up to the world's standard of beauty I mean they'll torment their bodies excessive exercise excessive dieting they'll put teeth whitening strips on their teeth till the enamel's gone they'll go to the tanning booth until their skin is leather and they'll submit themselves to all kinds of painful cosmetic surgeries trying to measure up to this world's standard of beauty amen but I'm telling you there's a group of people they want to measure up to God's standard of the holiness of Christ and those people have such a desire for God to work in their life that they come and present themselves and say oh God I open up my heart I open up my mind I open up my life and God I want you to do your work in me sanctify me would you come music sanctify me okay let's call it transformation amen be not conformed to this world but be it transformed by the renewing of your mind that word transformed the Greek is metamorphosis and they have used that to describe in science the changing of a tadpole to a frog and the changing of, of that old caterpillar to a butterfly. I've told you before because it just, even as an old person, it had such an impact on me. But about two years ago in the fall, Mike, uh, Mike, Andrew came in from the garden and, 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 he, and he, had a, he, he had a cocoon. And I know I'm not going to get all the technical names right, but he had a cocoon on a piece of grass. And he said, Dad, what, is this what I think it is? Yes, it is. What will it be? I said, I don't know. Will it be a moth or a butterfly? I'm not sure. Amen. I didn't get that all right. Let me back up the story. Let me rewind. Hey Amen. Can't even do that anymore. You got CDs. You can't even rewind. He came in this big old caterpillar. I mean, it was huge. Big around and ugly. And he said, what's this going to be? I said, I don't know. He said, can I put it in the jar? Yeah, you can. He put it in the jar, put, put the lid on it. And just a few days, the first amazement was the caterpillar was gone. There was a cocoon in its place. He said, Dad, when will it come out? I didn't know my physical science very well well I said I don't know I don't think it will come out until next spring oh daddy you sure will be that long I'm pretty sure it will be son it wasn't just a few days later amen he was at school Sandra was in the house she said come here honey hurry I said what is it something bad wrong no I just want you to see this and there instead of that ugly caterpillar instead of that cocoon there was a monarch butterfly spreading its wings I'm telling you I'm old but I stood and marveled how that 
old ugly caterpillar could turn into that beautiful butterfly that looks so completely different I'm telling you it's a matter of amazement it's metamorphosis it is transformation but then I thought today if God could put that in the laws of nature if God could put that in the genetics of a caterpillar don't you think the same God is able to come into our hearts and transform and change us into the likeness and the image of Jesus Christ if you want sanctification would you stand and say Lord sanctify me holy sanctify me spirit and soul and body let's seek him tonight oh oh change my heart oh God make me more like you Change my heart, oh God. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. I'm not talking about self-righteous piety. I'm talking about someone that genuinely recognizes that though they've been saved by grace, oh, there's so much that they desire and want God to do in their life. I wonder if you're here tonight and, and I'm, not, I'm not putting any pressure on. I know this comes and goes at different moments of God's moving. But I wonder if you're here tonight and, and you, do, you, you do relate to that. You do feel that desire saying, God, cleanse me. I, I don't like the, some of the thoughts I've been having. I don't like some of the attitudes I've had. I don't like that the world has such a pull on me. And I'm so attracted to the world. If, if there's a desire in your heart tonight for God to purify and to transform me, would you just begin to come and fill these altars and say, change me, Lord. Change me, Lord. I don't want to be the same. I want you to do the work of your spirit, the work of your word sanctify them through thy word thy word is tr the truth thy word is truth change me change my, the way I think change the way I feel change the way I do change me oh Lord change me oh Lord change me oh Lord it's not that I can't it's I don't want to it's not that I have to it's that I love the Lord and I want Him. I want to be like Him. I want my life to be like Him. I want my attitude, my motive, my lifestyle.